Hello everyone, my name is Erica Harris and I'll talk to you about populist radical right in Eastern and Central Europe. Um, I am very sorry that we are actually, I can't really do this um, talking to you to slides one by one. Uh, somehow it doesn't seem to work, so uh, please look at the slides um, on a separate occasion or if you want, uh, whilst I'm talking, you have them on a separate document. Um, you will see that there is a picture of, an, uh, of four prime ministers of Central European countries, Poland, Hungary, Slovakia and the Czech Republic. The reason there is that picture there is because during the migration crisis of 2015 to 16, there was an observable and quite shocking rise of radical right rhetoric coming actually from the mainstream political parties. Um, sorry, I just paused because I had a feeling that it was not recording, but it is. Great. Um, and that led to many academics and political observers to question uh, how great the gap or is there a gap or between the West and the East and is the whole post-communist order unraveling. Um, now, my argument will be that there is a difference. Um, the post-communist order is not unraveling, but there is a difference um, between West radical right and East radical right, and I'll say something about why. Uh, the first thing probably to say is that um, there is a tradition of ethnic nationalism which goes back to um, interwar period and fascism and that the history of uh, post-communist societies is very different and therefore has certain specifics which do make it, which make it for a difference, but let me first say something about the overlapping characteristics between populist radical right in Eastern uh, and Central Europe and Western Europe. And these overlapping characteristics are nativism, authoritarianism and populism. And uh, when we looking through the historical lens, it is immediately obvious that unemployment ex and unemployment and xenophobia, which are driving motors of the radical right in Western Europe, is not actually an adequate lens through which to, to analyze uh, post-communist radical right. Um, uh, one of the reasons is that the radical right parties in Western Europe, some of them have been around for a long time and have participated in um, democratic competition. Uh, this can't be said about Eastern Europe and it does appear that migration crisis was a catalyst for this radical right, um, emergence of the radical right. Um, so what are the overlapping characteristics? Well, there are nativism, authoritarianism and populism. Um, nativism is very close to rather virulent form of ethnic nationalism that assumes that the homogeneity of the nation state, as it were, owned by a native ethnic group um, 
who then should also have more privileges when it comes to employment and benefits of the state. So uh, the na nativism drew uh, radical right in Western Europe, so did authoritarianism, uh, which is a kind of a appeal to a strictly ordered society and populism. These are overlapping characteristics um, for a I mean, for an example of a populist rhetoric, um, you have a slide um, with a citation from the website for from the Slovak People's Party, who, which has entered the parliament in 2016. This is actually a neo-Nazi party, and is not. Um, kind of radical right that actually uh, accept political system. This is an anti-systemic party, which its populist rhetoric actually rejects democracy. It blames parliamentary parties for, for stealing and betraying the stealing from the country betraying the nation. These are very, this is a very strong rhetoric. And rhetoric that we wouldn't actually hear probably as boldly expressed uh, by a party which is uh, competing in elections. Um, now, in the East, there are no large numbers of immigrants, but there is a, a manufactured fear of them, mostly by the mainstream parties as a part of uh, electoral competition. This radicalizing rhetoric of the mainstream parties has actually allowed um, parties of more extremist uh, uh, politics to be hard because whilst the politics uh, of mainstream was radical already, the people who did feel that, for example, in Slovakia, the mainstream political elites were implicated in corruption, were actually listening to this party who has never been in power and therefore could not be implicated in any corruption. Um, we, we have to understand that the radical right, the literature divides radical right when it comes to Eastern and Central Europe into something of old radical right and new radical right. And the the old radical right uh, is the, are the parties with roots in the history of fascism, whereas the new radical right um, focuses on anti-immigration rhetoric. In Eastern and Central Europe, we have a merger, actually, of old and new. Um, there is a history of fascism in that region some of the post-communist new states had a brief independence during the uh, fascist time uh, under the tutelage of the Nazi Germany. Nevertheless, that was the first experience of independence for those countries and uh, radical right um, uh, is become rather uh, sentimental about the independence, regardless the type of the state that it was. Um, so looking, uh, looking at the history of some of these states and therefore the political parties that have arisen there, um, unemployment and xenophobia is inadequate in explaining a radical right there. It is 
very, very important that we look at post-communist states um, and see what kind of um, history, we're not talking history long ago, we're talking fairly recent history, uh, the fall of communist regimes. Uh, fall of communist regimes was followed by a very rapid social, political, cultural, economic change uh, in a way that left very many people um, disappointed. Um, therefore, also looking with nostalgia to communist time and some, of course, even to pre-communist time. Uh, this, is, uh, this is very important because that is a very different evolution of the countries and therefore consequently the rhetoric and the, the, the appeals of the post-communist radical right are accordingly different. They take on uh, quite a number of issues that are non-existent in Western Europe. Um, in fact, even post-communist democratization uh, was very soon, soon overwhelmed by nationalism for rather a, a structural reason. If you claim that the people, that is the national people, have the right to decide their political destiny, then um, they also need to have a legitimate political unit uh, for these people to exercise their political uh, choice, which was democracy. That nevertheless very quickly led to nationalism, and breakdown of the existing states, creation of the new states, reposition borders once more, in fact, the third time in the 20th century. So you see that identity, ethnic identity, has historically been actually part of the political landscape in that part of Europe. Um, we refer to it um, as Eastern nationalism, not because people in Eastern Europe are very different to people in Western Europe, but because their history is different, and particularly since the Second World War, the Western Europe was developing very differently. They have joined, as it were, Europe um, after 1989, but there are some historical backlogs which make it different. Um, when it comes to the neo-Nazi parties, well, that example from Slovakia shows you and you see it on the slide, that that party was non-existent in any meaningful political form until 2016, which was exactly after the, after the migration crisis. Um, how did that happen? Uh, because it was unexpected, it was shocking, uh, all the polls uh, showed that um, people um, have a very uh, grim view of extremism, but nevertheless, uh, some um, enough people voted to give this party 14 seats in a 150-seat parliament. Uh, its leader, uh, Mr. Marian Kotleba, um, was elected mayor in 2013 in a central uh, Slovakian region and as a mayor he gained personal legitimacy. Um, the 
the rhetoric of this party was against the mainstream parties that were too often implicated in uh, corruption scandals. Um, also, the rhetoric of the mainstream was so radical that the people who voted against the ma mainstream accepted even more radical, more extreme rhetoric. Um, um, radical rhetoric is a slippery slope. It's also a very competitive rhetorical field. And um, so the radicalization becomes normalized and therefore the rhetoric becomes more and more extreme. Um, there is also, of course, a, an absence of liberal democratic parties for long enough to establish the liberal democratic values. So there are, there are reasons why and there are then further reasons which are to do with the education. Uh, why we say education is because 22% um, of first-time voters have voted for this party, uh, which they maybe thought was rather cool. Um, it is because uh, communist regimes did not discuss um, Second World War, and they did discuss Second World War, but only for, in terms of the Nazi Germany and communism that fought against it. They did not discuss the collaboration of the local population with the Nazi Germany. They, don't, they did not engage in discussing the dangers of totalitarian regimes. And when communist, communism finished, post-communist societies were busy state and nation building the new state and also rewrote history as it were, as, is, as was more useful and suitable for that time, um, what we actually see is that there is a relativization of values and historical events and that population does not um, understand, does not have a critical understanding of themes that are propagated by the radical right. I would urge you to read the article, my article uh, titled Nation Before Democracy, which actually will make all these points uh, clearer. I don't want to talk to you too much on this re um, recording, so I leave it here. Thank you very much.